internet, and welcome to episode 7 of On War the Podcast. In this episode, Austin and I delve into the formal, and perhaps more importantly, informal, laws of war, and explore their history, as well as their continued relevance in modern conflict. So, before we get into any of the rest of the today's episode, just one or two ad- administrative things. First of all, we've shattered the 500 views over the last week. Uh, that is to say, over the last week we've hit our all-time record of more than uh, 500 views. So thank you very much for all of our listeners and subscribers for that. And as part and parcel on that, as we said in the first episode, these kinds of things work best when they're a discussion, not just between yourself and myself, Austin, but with our wider audience. And so uh, to sort of champion that, we've started our own subreddit. So anyone interested in giving feedback on this episode or any of the previous episodes, uh, especially if you'd like to talk about what you'd like to see next, or if you just want a place to, to talk about the themes we have, we have got a subreddit that is uh, slash r slash on war podcast with uh, camel case, so capital O, capital W, capital P. So please, uh, the links will be in the comment section below. Please Feel free to come out and have a chat to Austin and I. Feel free to address any questions to one of us or both of us as you like, but it's a fantastic venue that works, I think, very well for where we want to go as this podcast develops. All right, this episode, uh, we're talking about the uses and abuses of the laws of war. And I guess we're addressing two related but distinctly separate topics in this. The Latin would be jus ad bellum, that's the, the, the just causes for war, the legitimization of war, and juice in bello, the rules of war. Now, this is much more your field of expertise than it is mine, Austin, so I'm going to be taking a little bit of a, a commentary role, more than a discussion. But uh, where do we start with this? You, you hit the nail on the head. Most people enter into discussions about international law, and specifically the laws of armed conflict. So I think before we start anything, it's worth doing a little bit of definitional work. So... What we're talking about here is effectively the laws that govern any form of formalized armed conflict, whether the parties have officially subscribed to them or not. This is where the concept of war crimes come from. For those of you who aren't into the field, um, you'll hear this called a number of things. I can call it the law of war. Law of armed conflict is a particularly popular term among military personnel. The official term used by most international bodies is actually called international humanitarian law which is a little bit of a misnomer. But so in this discussion, we're probably going to switch between all three definitions, but they all mean the same thing. What we're talking about here is the the norms and the laws that govern people's conduct during hostilities. And I think we can we can really sort of delve into that a little bit here at first, Alistair. I think we look at, you know, how, how do we reach this point now where we have a set of laws, we have a set of norms that govern conflict between what we, you know, the old term would be civilised nations. But this isn't something we just magically appeared from. This is something that, you know, has has come basically developed alongside the wooden stick. So I've been doing a little bit of background reading on this, and I have a quote from um, John of Legano, who was a 14th century jurist, an Italian, who authored a book, De Bello, um, the, the War. I guess would be the the translation of that. My Latin is terrible. And his quote is, The Lord appointed new wars. His people had known him as the god of battles, and he even instructed Joshua as the means of laying an ambush for his enemies. Um, And later he talks about, uh, As touching the harms that be done above the right and droit of war, that cometh not of the right of war, but by the evilness of the people who use it evilly. Uh, The point he's trying to make here is that uh, war is naturally ordained, uh, uh, sanctioned by God, in effect, so long as it's applied justly. Uh, and the evilness of conflict uh, comes not from the practice of war itself, as we might think of it as an, in a Western perspective, but those who engage in it without that sanction. So it's already creating a, a legitimizing narrative around the practice of war from at least one perspective, what we see now as, as modern laws of war sort of only really originates in its current form in the uh, 1600s. But before that, even as far back as St. Augustine, who came up with the concept of what was then called Christian just war theory, is what we call it now, 
um, which was refined by people like Thomas Aquinas, is a set of norms that people apply to their interactions with one another like anywhere else, and the norms are developed into laws. I think it's important to recognize straight off the bat that despite what some people may say, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, international law, and specifically international humanitarian law, applies explicitly to non-international conflicts or applies to all formal conflicts. So everything we've talked about in this podcast comes from a position of there is actually justified norms in place to govern behaviour during them. I think it's important to, to note that, I mean, even though this stuff comes from Christian war theory um, and just war theory, that's only where we trace its modern lineage. Um, as long as there's been people with, you know, sharp sticks, like I've said, there's been people writing about what's considered a justified way of using those sharp sticks. And, I mean, this was called a number of things. It's been called chivalry. It's been called honourable conflict. It's been called, you know, whatever you want to call it. What we're talking about here is a norm, a series of ethical guidelines, cultural limitations placed on on warfare, on, on killing other people. In its, in its modern context, though, it is split. Um, and it comes back to that the two Latin definitions Alistair referred to before, where firstly you're looking at whether a weapon can be considered a just or legal method of warfare. And then secondly, international humanitarian law also looks at what is a justified or legal method of using that tool in conflict. And so when you look at a modern a modern conflict, you're looking at two parts to it, really. You're looking at are the tools they're using legal, and to be so, they've got to be able to discriminate, and they can't deliberately cause obscene or, obs- or excessive damage to the environment. If they don't, if they offend these protocols, which are, are contained in Article 36 of the Additional Protocol 1 of the modern Geneva Convention, which is where all this modern international law comes from, then they're banned or they're restricted. So an example would be blinding laser weapons, which isn't actually as sci-fi as you might think. So there's that part of international law. And that's really easy, right? You can It's quite simple to look at a weapon system and go, okay, that's against international law in most cases. Where it really becomes tricky and where we start to actually have some really interesting discussions I think, and that's where this podcast will sort of look at, is that second aspect. It's what behaviours are justified, what behaviours are in in accordance with the principles of international law in conflict. And so I think that's that's sort of where we're looking at with this, Alistair. Hmm. And there's some overriding principles that seem to to guide this. I've got a couple of examples of early pre-Geneva discussions around this. So the first one of these that I looked at was the instructions for the governments of armies in the field, which was a field manual, one of the first field manuals produced for the American army uh, during the um, Civil War in 1863. So the Union government produced it, which explicitly states uh, in Article 6, peace is the normal condition, war is the exception. The ultimate object of all modern war is a renewed state of peace. The more vigorously wars are pursued, the better it is for humanity. Sharp wars are brief. And then it goes on in Article 7 um, to discuss how military necessity admits of all direct destruction of life or limb of the armed enemies and those whose destruction is incidentally unavoidable in armed contests of war, but not cruelty, that is, the infliction of suffering for the sake of suffering or revenge. So we've got this this combined imperative, and there are other articles that talk about this as well, uh, but this combined imperative that carries over to modern definitions, which is that conflict is the exception, and the, the objective, the ultimate objective, is a political resolution, and B, that although in conflict is recognised that uh, death and destruction is endemic, like this is this is how conflict is is fought, it's the last resort. And it should be targeted, it should be limited in its application where at all possible. So this is where the presumption of the innocence of civilians and so on comes from. For those of you playing the home game, the doctrine that Alistair just referred to is also known as the Lieber Code or the Lieber Code, um, 
And it is actually used is quite substantially. So, I mean, you can actually draw some pretty interesting parallels there um, into what we see as the modern Geneva Code, Geneva Convention codified laws around conflict and principles of, of IHL from exactly drawn from the, um, the LIBOR code and have been subsequently modified. So, for example, one of the main principles is that of necessity. So it argues that any military strike or military action must inflict only the necessary level of damage to achieve its military aim. It shouldn't go any further. It shouldn't inflict any further suffering, particularly on civilians. And a corollary of that says that any military damage to civilians or any risk of damage to civilians or civilian property um, should be proportionate to the military outcome. This all stems from that distinction that people draw between what we see as a combatant, which in layman's terms is a soldier, is a fighter, um, and a non-combatant, which would be a civilian in most cases. Now, a little later in the podcast, we're going to have a look at what those terms actually mean, and importantly, how they actually influence the way modern conflict works, because they are terms that have been imposed upon conflict based on an understanding of conflict that's only about 100 years old, which has meant that particularly in the modern era, we have like a rise of non-state actors in conflict. It's really challenging the conventional assumptions around those definitions, which creates a lot of issues with applying the principle, one of the principle procedures in, in international law, which is distinction, that any military strike has to distinguish between a combatant and a non-combatant, a military personnel and a civilian, or their property. Before we get into the discussion about com- combatant and non-combatant, I think there's another sort of underlying assumption that perhaps before we get into things like the insurgency and the war on terror, um, is the assumption of the, the primacy and centrality of the nation-state as the, the primary actor here. Or if we go back to John of Lugano, the assumption of the divine right of kings in the, the right to practice war is what, what he was referencing. And that's, before we get into sort of more modern conflicts where state and non-state actors tend to mix, I think that's an important thing to tease out here. There's a legitimizing narrative that's happening. War is the the practice of the state, not of anyone else. And if you do it elsewise, it's it's a criminal act. You can see that in the actual provisions for non-combatants, which were initially designed as this sort of secondary components of warfare. And you've got to remember that these conventions came out in the, in the early 20th century. And even before that, the concept of a civilian is actually a pretty modern term. And our conception of what that means is only about 100 years old. And so when you're looking further back, and particularly when you're looking at people like Lugano or St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, etc., the early scholars in this field, Largely, it didn't deal with the concept of a civilian. You have to remember at the time, and even in the Middle Ages, it would be perfectly acceptable for you to raise a city to the ground, assuming that you had given it one chance to surrender at the beginning of the siege. And this was considered okay. This was considered legal under their version of the laws of war because it complied with the cultural norm around conflict at the time. And so I think that's something we're really going to engage with as we go later in the podcast, is the fact that even though we call these things laws and breaching them is considered a war crime that can be punished by an international tribunal, what we've actually done is codified a modern view of what is acceptable in warfare. And to a large extent, what we've been doing lately is bringing in some of the assumptions and some of the beliefs that weren't codified in the initial Geneva Conventions purely because they weren't even considered part of warfare at that point. They didn't fit the cultural narrative that informed their development. So a really good example of this, Alistair, is a thing called the Martin's Clause. Now, the Martin's Clause was actually inserted in the Geneva Convention to, well, basically allay the fears of a single delegate from one of the minor powers to the discussion. And it was considered a very throwaway provision that was put in simply for political expediency, by, and it was led by a Russian diplomat, of all things, funnily enough. But nowadays, the Martin's Clause is regularly invoked as the key defining principle for justifying bans or controls 
on emerging military technologies from robotics to biological and chemical enhancement of soldiers. Now, the Martin's Clause effectively argues that the legality of any weapon system should be subject to the dictates of public conscience in cases that aren't, estab- aren't covered by established international law. And so what it tells us is that these laws that we currently abide by or that we, we try out to get our soldiers to abide by are codifications of norms around warfare that existed 100 years ago. And while they are in large part applied in a way that helps us and gives us an ethical high ground, we have to remember that these are very old laws. And like any laws, they're based on old cultural norms that need to be updated, that need to be interpreted. Otherwise, they gain and lose importance, like the Martin's Clause. The other point to bring out, and this is actually a good way to lead into to non-combatants, is that when we're looking at those older normative approaches, be they the norm, the ideas of, of civilized Christian war, or then um, the later sort of 18th century conceptions of, of uh, Jus in, uh, in Bello, so the laws of war, there's always been exceptions to it as well. The underlying uh, unsaid assumption of the Christian way of doing war is that it doesn't apply to non-Christians, so you can do whatever you like in that regard. And so we see all sorts of behaviours around the Crusades and attitudes towards the Moors in, North, in southern Spain. And then again, in the 18th century, we have very different approaches to what is civilised warfare in Europe, and then the suppression of, of uh, colonial insurrection. A great example of this is the, the famous dum-dum rounds, or non-jacketed expanding rounds. Uh, we would call them hollow points today. Uh, the name dum-dum rounds relates to the British arsenal that was producing them in dum-dum, which was at that time a town in India. Now, these rounds were not legal to be used in legal, in legitimate wars between European nations, but they were still produced in large quantities in India, largely for the use of police and in the suppression of colonial insurrections. So there's always been this sort of duality. A legitimate war is sanctioned and protected by these ideas, but there's always been an exclusionary category. Someone who is the barbarian other, someone who we don't have to play by the rules with. But it actually, it does actually apply even into the modern context. And I think that's, that's a good transition point into, into this. We sort of assume, uh, with the benefit of hindsight that we've developed past this, this concept of an other. Um, you know, and a lot of people will look back on colonial times and sort of go, Oh, well, those people, that's really bad. We wouldn't do that now, but we do. And I would certainly argue that we do. And to an extent, we have to realize that international law still only provides a framework which is then interpreted and applied through military doctrine, which is then interpreted and applied by the individual soldiers who take their own unconscious or otherwise biases into combat with them. And so a really good example of this is the fact that even the Australian Army's Law of Armed Conflict Manual, they have a whole manual on this, and the Australian Army is not the only one with a whole manual on this, The Australian Army, whoever, describes combatants as being all organised armed forces, groups and units, except medical and religious personnel, under command in a conflict subject to an internal disciplinary system that enforces compliance with the laws of armed conflict. They must also have a fixed distinctive sign, recognisable distance and carry arms openly. Now, that's an abbreviated definition. I've taken the, the, the pertinent bits out. What I really want to draw people's attention to is this line here where it says, which enforces compliance with the laws of armed conflict. This is a polite version, a legalese version, of effectively what Alice has just said, which is that we will apply the rules of armed conflict only when the other side is deemed to be complying with the same rules, who is entitled to the same protections, who is applying the same laws. If they don't, then the whole rule book gets thrown out the window. Now, in practice, that's watered down a lot, particularly in a modern context with things like the media. But the point is here, and this becomes really important in a second when we talk about politicization of the term combatant, but in modern conflicts, 
the enemy doesn't always play by the same rules, doesn't always follow international law. And what that creates is a legitimizing effect for extreme force, for measures that we wouldn't accept against other Western armies, people we view as legitimate combatants. And this is an important term, legitimate as opposed to legal. We accept a level of greater force against those individuals because they don't play the same rules. Well, a classic example of this can be found in the Second World War with the um, post hoc legitimization of the dropping of the atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The discourse that emerged immediately after that in the American press and the American culture was, look at Okinawa, look at the Pacific Islands. These people would have fought tooth and nail for every centimeter. There was no discussion about the broader political sphere, the demonstration of the atomic weapons at against, uh, to the Soviets, uh, sort of a, a look at we, what we've got now. They don't look at the Soviet pressure on the Japanese and the land war in China, um, nor do they talk about the broader bombing um, campaigns that we were uh, engaged in. The firebombing of Tokyo killed at least twice as many people by memory and four times as much land mass as the Hiroshima bomb, just in, in cinderies. The, the narrative that came out of this new weapon, which, by the way, has never been used in combat since, partly because we everyone seems to have agreed that, or everyone that has them seems to have agreed that you won't do that, which is a very normative thing. The justifications that, are, that came out of this was, they don't fight like us, this was the only way. True or not, and I'm not getting into whether or not those bombings were justified, I'm just looking at the narrative. And it continues to this day. I would argue that you a better example of what you're talking about, um, I think you're 100% right in terms of um, the, just, the post-war justification of the atomic bomb. Um, I would argue that there's a, a, greater, a greater blame to be placed on the, the during-the-war depiction of the Japanese, um, specifically the, the continued emphasis, even in modern media, on their use of suicide tactics, um, on their use of civilians as human shields, on their use of ambushes, etc., as demonstrative this and we still see it in, in military history, this concept of an eastern way of war. Um, that is somehow less honorable, less straight up, less forward than the Western way of war. What that's been interpreted as, historically at least, is a justification that these individuals are not entitled through their own actions. This is important. It's never us that are the bad guy in this debate, in this discourse. It's always their actions or a characteristics of them that has dis disallowed them, that has removed them from membership of what we see as the pinnacle level of the international community. They're somehow less than. And at the same time, more dangerous because of that non-obedience. And this is, this is nowhere more apparent, I think, than the current war on terror. And I think we can bring it around at this point to the, the absolutely ab absurd and horrendous term of illegal combat, which has been used as a, a terrible discursive device in order to legitimize torture, extrajudicial killing and assassinations, although the, the last two are pretty similar against a group of individuals based on their assigned membership to a particular group, in this case, terrorist, which is applied very selectively. So we've talked a little bit about earlier on the fact that there is this distinction between a combatant and a non-combatant. And the term illegal combatant, and this is why I have such a problem with it, just eliminates that entirely. And instead of having an objective international standard, it allows a state to assign um, not only the ability to be targeted, but also remove all the protections that are typically associated with being a combatant um, in italics. And one of those is to be treated as a prisoner of war, for example, with all the attendant pr protections, um, not to be tortured, etc. If you make someone an illegal combatant or another term that's been used is illegitimate combatant, then they not only do they not get any protection under the laws of war, they also don't get any protections as a non-combatant. 
Now, I, I have some issues that I've, I've raised with Alice previously, and I can raise again, um, with the, even the concept of non-combatant, which is a, a negative term, by the way, people. It simply is someone who doesn't fit the criteria of being a combatant. This is important, and I would argue this is the most crucial part of when we talk about the uses and abuses of international humanitarian law, is that the principle of distinction requires belligerents to distinguish between these two categories of individuals, as well as attendant objects. So destruction of civilian property is allowed. But it only considers the direct targeting of an attack. So even though it could offend the proportionality principle, if you look at distinction alone, it doesn't actually matter to an extent that if civilians are caught in the crossfire, the attack must be directly targeted at a combatant, or in this case, an illegal combatant, which then takes the whole conflict out of international law and into domestic law, which has its attendant problems. And I, this is my issue as, as we sort of move on. But uh, Alistair, I think, has a different interpretation of the distinctions there in terms of non-combatant status, particularly in, in sort of localized wars. Well, I mean, the first thing I would say, or the first thing that a, someone classed as an illegal combatant might say in these circumstances is looking on these these terms, they are shaped clearly um, to talk to a conventional war. And the very practice of asymmetrical war, be that insurgency, be that the use of terrorist tactics, as we've talked just in the last episode, terrorism is something to be considered more of a tactic rather than a form of war in a, unto itself. But the first thing someone practicing that would say is that the reason why we have taken this length is that we are trying to achieve a political goal, be that the independence of people X or the creation of politico-religious territory Y. We have tried to make our voices heard in other ways, and we feel that they haven't, and this is our last resort. And we specifically, we cannot engage in, we do not have the resources to engage in the kind of conflict defined by these rules. These rules that have been created by you, our oppressors, so, of course, we're not going to play by them. There are a, a narrative that's been formed to legitimize a type of conflict that the the op opposing force, in this case, in, in, in the illegal combatant, can't possibly compete on. So it's only natural that they're going to seek other techniques to move forward. Now, the fact that we'd step down from that moral position of what we will and won't do and to fight it, most of the time will only aid their cause. If we look at the kind of actions that were taken in Vietnam, some of the things that have happened in the Middle East, these are the kinds of responses that that drive rather than suppress insurgency until we start getting into the political responses, which is a different thing. The other thing I'd sort of say here is that we haven't seen much of the kind of conflict that these norms and laws were shaped to respond to. In many ways, this is a very out-of-date structure um, that doesn't respond to the, the evolution of conflict. Not so much in the weapons we use, because he said the Martin's Clause is something that has actually got a really interesting uh, way of adapting. But in terms of our justification for war, the just cause for war, it hasn't kept pace with the evolution of non-state actors um, in the modern scene. It hasn't kept pace, with, even with the, the post-colonial and, and um, wars of the 1970s. So I think in a lot of ways, these are very... There, there are a lot of things about this, this code that are very outdated and really shape a kind of narrative that excludes the kind of people who are already willing to take up violent action, take up arms because of their exclusion. The, this kind of narrative and, and the way it's interpreted to project unbridled, unrelenting force. It's really quite counterproductive in that way. See, I, I don't think that it's it's unbridled is certainly not a term I, I would agree with. Um, there is an ability, almost an assumption, that uh, particularly people in our field um, of the realist school in particular and the neo-versions would argue that you know, international law is, is a farce. It has no teeth, etc. But and, and it is old, and I, I've made that point previously, even in this episode, that it is old and it, sometimes it is out of date. But through the actions of 
people like the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, etc. We've created interpretive guidelines that have allowed these old laws to accommodate to an extent um, newer things. So I'll give you an example. So Article 43, um, subsection 2, um, argues, of the Dean of Conventions, argues that members of an armed force of a party to the conflict can be combatants. That is to say they have a right to participate directly in hostilities. Now, on a literal interpretation of the code, of the convention, it only really refers to states. It's been interpreted subsequently to include non-state actors as a party to the conflict. And so, for example, something like al-Qaeda or ISIS, where a state has legitimized them by declaring war on them, in this case the US for the authorization for use of military force, we create, a, we allow these laws to be applied if we want them to. And this is why the US felt the need to create the term illegal combatant. It does, though, allow us to have some really interesting stuff being played with here. And I think that's that's why I would argue that it, 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 it doesn't allow unbridled use of force, although certainly the discourse lowers the public standard we hold our officials to account to. Um, a good example of this is the increasing use of, of um, civilians in conflict through things like private military, military contractors, which I know is a really interesting area of yours, Alistair, but also through civilian drone pilots, civilian engineers who are forward deployed, um, civilian technicians, um, even um, people like Serco and um, forward deployed Halliburton, for example, forward deployed private logistics people in conflict zones. Now, they arguably are participating in the conflict, are providing a military benefit, and they therefore be reasonably legitimate targets for assault. And it raises some really interesting questions that I, I don't think we'll ever get to in this podcast, but I think it's worth people starting to think on. Things like, you know, at what point does a civilian cross that line as a pilot of a remote drone, for example? And if they are a combatant or acting as a combatant for that period of time in the same way as a violent non-state actor is, who, by the way, as soon as they put down their weapon becomes a civilian again, with all of the attached protections. But if they're flying a drone, for example, from Nevada, and if you look at Crash Air Force Base, it's across the road from a major town, literally, Google Earth it. Is it legitimate to target that base with a cruise missile, for example, if you're a Chinese general? Now, I would argue that it is. Now, that's an extremely modern example of a situation that isn't covered by these old laws but has been interpreted subsequently. And so I think it's a little bit too harsh, I think, to say that these these codes are old enough that they allow unbridled use of force. Well, so on two points on that. First, I think there are examples. And when I say unbridled use of force, I think that they allow for it. I don't think it's necessarily always been used. But I think also the designation of free fire zones uh, in Afghanistan and in Iraq, I think that pretty much meets the criteria for unbridled use of force. If you're a military-aged male in this zone, you may be targeted, and you know better than I, Austin, what that definition actually came down to. The second point um, to make about PMCs, I think there's a couple of interesting cases. Um, depending on their contract and depending on how they fit, uh, and, t and depending on their actions they take, um, there are lots of different ways to look at how these contractors may fit in that realm. I think if, if we took a hypothetical um, meeting between a private military, American private military contractor and a Russian in Syria, this is all a purely hypothetical thing, um, I think that it might be perfectly reasonable for the uh, Russian to designate that individual an illegal combatant in a lot of the ways it's been interpreted. That's a very hypothetical one. So to bring you uh, sort of a more accurate one, a more grounded in history, uh, in Iraq, private military contractors were under various agreements, not subject to um, Iraqi law, even though they were citizens, ci uh, sorry, civilians operating in Iraq on American passports, um, various agreements meant that they were not subject to Iraqi law, which meant that a lot of things that Blackwater was very famous for and a few other companies um, simply went un unprosecuted or, or 
prosecuted quietly under the rugs because it was able to be brought back home. And there's lots of discussions. I mean, the history of, of mercenaries and private military contractors is full of all sorts of interesting escapades and, and dastardly deeds. But the way it was shaped in the discourse of legitimacy and um, legalese, as you say, is, is quite interesting and, and worth an episode all of its own. I think in the future we, we'll have to do a mercenaries one. But the, the international community of the Red Cross has actually come up with specific guidelines. And I mean, these aren't accepted by all states and not even by all non-state um, think tanks. But there are there are two for non-combatant participation in hostilities and mercenaries would, would arguably cover both. These are and they've been applied to explicitly applied to the inner literature to Al Qaeda, but would also apply to something like Blackwater in Iraq, as the example you're, you're referring to there. So direct participation in hostilities. And that's the one I referred to earlier, where a civilian can pick up a firearm and as long as they've got it and they're participating, they're shooting or they're providing a direct benefit to the military campaign of a, a participating party, they can be targeted. But as soon as they drop it, they're a civilian again and they can't be. But clearly applies to what you're talking about with mercenaries. Equally, it also talks about this continuous combat function, uh, which refers more to the planners. But it has to be involved. And this is really interesting for what you're talking about with someone like Blackwater, where they have a, a combatant arm or, or a securitized armed force version of the organization and also support personnel. So continuous combat function, among other things, and I encourage everyone to look it up for um, much more detail than I'll provide here. But one of the things it talks about is that the person has to be actively involved in the military arm of the organization. And that's there not so much for military, uh, sorry, mercenary personalities like what you're talking about, but more for your sort of 80s era FARC type um, groups where there was a political arm to the organization and a militant arm. Um, and it was there so that um, states couldn't say, you know, this person is a lawyer for that group and therefore can be targeted by military action. Well, no, because they're not part of the military wing of that organization. And so I think even though there, there is an argument to be made about mercenaries, as you're saying, um, the law has adapted to an extent. The, the law or the propositions put forward by the Red Cross, because they're not quite the same thing. They're not. And I think that's where that's where we sort of get into a gray area. Um, and you've picked up really well on that, actually. Um, you got, we have to remember that these, these are laws in name only, right? These are laws because states are individually willing to enforce them. Or they're in the case of someone like Australia, for instance, they've been ratified like any international law, although in this case into Australian military justice law. Effectively, what they are is norms. And this is why their impact on doctrine is the most important aspect. Um, and because of that, I would argue that they are, there's not as much difference in importance between the written law, the codified conventions, and the um, interpretative guidelines of someone like the International Committee of the Red Cross. Because wh which one of those two is enforced is very much determinant on the doctrine of the um, controlling state or non-state actor, what they're training their forces to do. And you also have to remember that the ICRC are the people who are teaching soldiers and non-state combatants about these laws. And so it is almost always interpreted through the lens of an ICRC volunteer or lawyer. I think there's an important distinction there, though, because in the case of an international law or a ratified treaty, there are official channels with which a dispute may be resolved and someone brought, not brought to justice, but held to account through the International Criminal Court or through other mechanisms as dependent on the treaty. And I think that the power of that can be demonstrated in, for example, the United States' refusal to ratify a number of treaties, including the ban on cluster munitions. And have they signed the mine, the landmine ban yet or not? The Ottawa Convention? I think they've signed it, but they haven't ratified it. Okay. So I think that demonstrates the power that um, the, the very formal legal versions of these um, discussions have, as opposed to the normative approaches. The second point... I'll just cut you off there for a second, Alistair. I think it's important, though, to recognise there. I mean, the most important one they haven't signed is the Rome Statute, which means that the ICC doesn't cover them, in effect. Another state can charge a US service member, but the US doesn't have to provide the service member to be tried. 
The other thing to remember here is that when you talk about other mechanisms, those are often things like peace and reconciliation committees, as what's currently happening in Timor, um, or they're domestic state tribunals that are overseen by international authorities. Justice Kirby, who was formerly from the Australian High Court, was in charge of the um, the international trials in Cambodia until recently. Um, so even though we hold the ICC as the main trier of war crimes, the smaller tactical level war crimes are often tried by domestic authorities, either during or more commonly but after. But there's a still conflict. a differentiation between the, the formal statutes, treaties and laws and the, the more normative approaches. I think it's that wriggle room that creates the grey area that allows a whole raft of things, including the designation of illegal combatant, to occur is that we don't have a formal distinction. We don't have a formal category that allows us to to, to prevent or, ch or create a chain of responsibility for this. Instead, what we have is the ICRC's recommendations. We have understand normative understandings that are shaped as much by the guidelines that are produced by um, international humanitarian law organizations like the Red Cross and others, and, uh, and by practical concerns. I mean, hearts and minds as a doctrine emerges not because the, the Red Cross or anyone else petitioned strongly enough, but because it, shock and awe, doctrine wasn't working. So there's a practicality input there as well. It has nothing to do with humanitarian law or otherwise. But I think there is an important distinction to be made there between the normative approach and the, the, the formal laws and treaties of which there's a vast network. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you to an extent. Um, there's, there's definitely value in having that distinction. My argument would be, though, that the distinction is not as apparent in practical terms as it is in domestic law um, and legal norms. Well, part of that would be because um, in domestic law, there is a um, you, there's no opt-out. Um, you mentioned before that the U.S. hasn't signed the Rome Statute, but so they they're not able to be, individual servicemen and, and others are not able to be tried through the ICC. Whereas in domestic law, you know, if you're there and you're nicked, son, then that's it. So we're, we're coming towards the end of our time here. Do you have any further comments to make on this? I think it's something we had to cover um, when we're looking at how warfare has developed, because warfare has developed, despite any criticism to the contrary, warfare has developed alongside its own set of norms. Um, war is 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 a very specific and, and unique circumstance for humans to find themselves in. And alongside this culture of, of, of a warrior, of, of an identity of a combatant, we've developed our own um, cultural norms, rules of conflict. And they, despite the fact that they're often toothless in terms of legal responses, they do um, influence the culture in military environments. They do influence the actions and so it's important to recognize that this is always in the back of soldiers' minds. And if they had their way, if they were able to, I, I am 100% confident that every soldier would follow these laws because they are based on that, that idealist concept of maintaining our humanity even in the depths of warfare. Um, and so it's, I think it's important to remember these, these norms that are always under the surface as we continue on in discussing warfare. I See, I would actually disagree with you on that. I think that that's a, a very noble point to take, and I think that many servicemen and women will, in the course of their careers, always strive with that ideal. But I, w I would turn back to Clausewitz on this. I would close with a quote from him that, if the wars of civilized people are less cruel and destructive than those savages, that is, the non-European other, the difference arises from the social condition of both both of states in them, themselves and in their relationships to each other. Out of this social condition and its relations, war arises, and by war it is subjected to conditions, is controlled and modified. But these things do not belong to war itself. They are only given conditions, and to introduce a, into the philosophy of war itself a principle of moderation would be an absurdity. Now, to tease out of that, my closing comments would be that throughout its history, the norms and laws of war have been as much a tool for the legitimization of conflict as they have been in restricting and governing it. And that it really is, as Klauswitz says, 
the mutual agreement that really limits the, the application of conflict. And the moment you have a breakdown of that mutual agreement, be that different ideas of war th between states, as we saw in Japan um, and the West in World War II, or even in the, the Eastern Front between um, the, um, in the distinctions between the practice on the Eastern Front and the Western Front of World War II and the German actions, depending on who they were fighting there, or the or asymmetrical fighters, be they the Viet Cong, FARC, or the Taliban, or modern Al Qaeda, or ISIS. It is simply by those mutual recognition of these norms that any kind of meaning can be pulled out at all. Well, once again, we're completely out of time. If you've enjoyed the show and have some ideas of some of the topics you'd like us to cover, or have some feedback for us, why not join in the discussion? Our new subreddit gives you, the listeners, a great space to engage in the debates these episodes raise, and we're very excited to see what your thoughts are on these topics. If you'd like to join in, you can find us at slash r slash onwarpodcast, or in the links below. As always, further reading on today's episode and previous ones can be found on our blog at www.onwarthepodcast.wordpress.com. Join us next episode as we continue to bridge the gap between laws and wars with a discussion on militarized law enforcement, examining how conflict shapes the actions of police deployed both overseas and at home. Once again, thank you for listening, and good night.